Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing quotient groups. Okay, right, so we've now discussed the construction of a quotient group. Okay, we've even seen an example of the construction of a quotient group. What I want to do in this next video is to move on to discussing the first isomorphism theorem. Okay, now the first isomorphism theorem is a theorem about homomorphisms, okay? And it is going to give us a complete picture of what a group homomorphism actually is. Okay, so if you are following this playlist on group theory, um, in the video on group homomorphisms, I continually say that uh, we will get a complete picture of what a group homomorphism actually is, but that I'll present it in this video on quotient groups. Okay, now I'm going to make good on that promise. Okay, right. Uh, so let's now study then the first isomorphism theorem. So firstly, let me just remind you briefly of what a group homomorphism is. Okay, so uh, remembering back to the video on group homomorphisms, in that video we see that there really is no point in considering non-subjective homomorphisms. Okay, if you have a non-subjective homomorphism, you can always reduce that into thinking in terms of a subjective subjective homomorphism. Okay, so we will just be uh, talking about subjective homomorphisms here. Okay, right. So a group homomorphism is a mapping which in the previous video on group homomorphisms we always uh, called phi, okay, which maps one group onto another. Okay, so we'll be consistent with notation and we'll call the domain group capital G, okay, and we'll call the codomain group capital G prime. Okay, so it maps the elements of the group capital G onto elements in the group capital G prime. And as I say, we we will assume that this is a subjective homomorphism, okay, which means that it's onto. All the elements in this codomain group, capital G prime, have elements in the domain group, capital G, being mapped onto them. Okay, so just to draw a picture of this, let's uh, denote the set that underlies our domain group, capital G, here as this box. Okay, and we'll colour code it. So capital G is here, this is our domain group, okay, and then we'll have our a uh, codomain group over here, also represented as a box, which I'll colour code in red here. Okay, like so. And basically, what this is going to do is it's going to take every symbol in our domain group, capital G here, and it's going to map it onto uh, a symbol in our codomain group, capital G prime, and as I say, subjective means that every symbol in our codomain group, capital G prime here, will have at least one symbol in the domain group, capital G, being mapped onto it. So it's an onto mapping, and we're just going to assume that this is a subjective homomorphism. And as we show in the uh, video on group homomorphisms, you can always reduce a non-subjective homomorphism into thinking in terms of a subjective homomorphism. Okay, right. Uh, now, uh, a group homomorphism has to be more, however, than just a mapping like so. It has to uh, obey a certain criterion called the property of homomorphisms. Okay, and this criterion is that phi of A composed with B must equal phi of A composed with phi of B. Okay, now, that needs to be true for all little a and little b that you can think up of uh, from our domain group, capital G. So whatever little a and little b you take uh, within our domain group, capital G, it has to be true that if you firstly compose these two elements together in the domain group, so this composition here, which I'll highlight in green here, this means composition in the domain group, capital G here, okay, if you compose A and B together first to get an answer in the domain group and then take phi of that answer, so you then map it into the codomain group, that has to be the same as if you firstly map A and B into the codomain group and then compose the two answers together in the codomain group. So this is composition in the codomain group. And that has to be true for all little a and little b is an element of the group capital G. Okay, so that's the property of homomorphisms.
Okay, right, uh, so that's what a homomorphism is, and we're just going to be considering subjective homomorphisms. Okay, right, so let me now state the first isomorphism theorem. So the first isomorphism theorem says that this codomain group, G prime here, is going to be isomorphic to the quotient group of the domain group by the kernel of the homomorphism. So it's isomorphic to G by the kernel of the homomorphism phi. Okay, so this here, this is a statement of the first isomorphism theorem, and we want to uh, discuss this and prove it and get some very nice understanding of group homomorphisms from this, basically. Okay, now I must state that we are assuming that the um, that the homomorphism here was a subjective homomorphism. If it was not a subjective homomorphism, then you have to turn the G prime here to the image of the homomorphism, okay? Because remember, when you reduce a non-subjective homomorphism into a subjective homomorphism, the way that you do it is by replacing the codomain group with the image of the homomorphism, okay? And then viewing the m mapping now as being from the code, sorry, from the domain group into the image of the homomorphism, okay? And we discuss that in a lot more detail in the video on group homomorphisms. So if it was a non-subjective homomorphism, you just replace uh, G prime with the image image of the homomorphism, but we all assume that G prime, uh, you know, that that is the image of the homomorphism, and we are working with a subjective homomorphism. Okay, right. Uh, so, um, what does this actually mean? So firstly, let me just remind you of what the kernel of a homomorphism is. We define this in the video on group homomorphisms. Okay, but I'll just go over it again because it's going to be an incredibly important concept. Okay, uh, so the kernel of the homomorphism, remember, means all the elements, uh, little g, which is in the domain group. So you take all the elements of the domain group, capital G here, such that when you ask what is phi of little g, the answer is equal to the identity element in g prime. Okay, so this is my notation for the identity element in g prime here. Okay, E subscript G prime. Okay, so basically the kernel of a homomorphism, which I'll underline in blue here, means all elements in the domain group, capital G here, which are mapped onto the identity elements in capital G prime by the homomorphism phi. Okay, and we proved in the video on group homomorphisms that this is a subgroup, and in fact it's actually a normal subgroup. Okay, so what we can now do then is we can use this to quotient out our domain group. Okay, so if I draw a picture here, once again I'll draw uh, my domain group here. So this is representing my domain group, capital G. Okay, so I will once again color code this in in green here. Okay, so the kernel of the homomorphism is a subgroup of uh, my domain group here, so I'll mark that on, so we'll have it here. So this is going to be equal to the kernel of the homomorphism, and this is just simply all the elements of the domain group which are mapped onto the identity in the codomain group by this homomorphism phi, basically. Okay, and it's actually forming a normal subgroup. Right, so to get a better understanding of the first isomorphism theorem, and don't worry, I don't expect you to have any understanding of why this is true yet, okay, but to try and understand where this is, comes from, okay, and why this is true, I firstly just want to think about what the right-hand side actually would be, okay, so what we know at the moment is that the kernel of a homomorphism is always a normal subgroup, of our domain group, capital G. So, in principle, what we can now do is form the quotient group of G by the kernel of the homomorphism. So, let's tackle this right-hand side first, okay, and then we'll try and understand why it's so related to the codomain group, and this will give us a very nice understanding of what homomorphisms actually are. Okay, right, so let's consider then the quotient group of the domain group G by the kernel of the homomorphism. So what does that actually mean? Well, that means partition up the domain group, capital G, into the cosets of this normal subgroup. So we're going to divide up capital G here into its cosets, um, the cosets of the kernel of the homomorphism here. 
Then what we'll do is give every single coset of the kernel of the homomorphism a name and stick these symbols for the cosets into a set which will form the quotient group of G by the kernel of the homomorphism. However, before we go any further, what I want to consider is the cosets of the kernel of the homomorphism. Specifically, what I want to show you is that actually all the elements in the same coset of the kernel of the homomorphism are going to be mapped onto the same element in G prime, and this gives us a lot of insight into the nature of group homomorphisms. Okay, so let me just add in the codomain group here into this picture. So let's have G prime here, and I will once again color code G prime in red here. Okay. And basically, what I now want to show you is that all of the elements within the same coset uh, of the kernel of the homomorphism are going to be mapped in, onto the same elements in the codomain by this homomorphism phi. Okay, so to prove this, let me take an arbitrary coset of the kernel of the homomorphism. So let's say we'll go for this one here. Okay, now this coset will contain at least one element, and let's call that element little a, and therefore we'll call the entire coset a bar, the coset that contains a. Okay, uh, and what I want to show you is that all of the elements in this coset a bar are all mapped onto the same element in G prime as little a here. Okay, so little a, what's little a going to be mapped onto? in the codomain uh, group over here by this homomorphism phi, well, it will be mapped onto some element which we can just denote phi of A. Okay, and what we now want to show is that all the other elements in this coset A bar are also mapped onto phi of A by this um, homomorphism phi. Okay, right, so let's take an arbitrary element within this coset A bar and show that phi of that arbitrary element will equal phi of A. Okay, now what is an arbitrary element within this coset A bar? Um, what does that actually look like? Okay, well, of course, this is the coset of the kernel of the homomorphism, and because the kernel of the homomorphism is a normal subgroup, we can either view this as being the left coset of the kernel of the homomorphism under the element little a, or you could view it as being the right coset of the kernel of the homomorphism under the element little a. The two things are identical, and they're both equal to this set, basically. Okay, uh, we will go for the left coset of the kernel of the homomorphism under this element little a, which means that I can write an arbitrary element of this coset a bar in the form little a composed with some little n, where this little n is some element of the kernel of the homomorphism. Okay, so it's a composed with n, where n is some arbitrary element of the kernel of the homomorphism here. Okay, right. Uh, so what I now want to do is consider what this arbitrary element of this coset A bar is mapped onto by the homomorphism phi. So I want to consider what is phi of A composed with little n. Now remember, this composition here, little a composed with little n, this is composition in the domain group, capital G. Okay, now, what I can now apply is the law of homomorphisms here. Okay, because I've got exactly something of this form. We've got a little a and a little b, effectively, here. Okay, and what I can now do is split this down into phi of a, composed now in the codomain group over here, with phi of little n. Okay, so this composition here is composition in the codomain group. Now, why is that a good thing? Okay, well, because we know what phi of little n is. Little n is an element of the kernel of the homomorphism. The definition of the kernel of the homomorphism is the set of all elements in the domain group, capital G, which are mapped onto the identity element in capital G prime. Okay, so the answer here has to be the identity element in G prime, basically. Okay, whatever little n is in the kernel of the homomorphism, it's always mapped onto the identity in G prime. So effectively, putting this on this picture, all of these elements in the kernel of the homomorphism are always mapped onto the identity in G prime. Okay, so now I can just replace this with the identity of G prime, and of course, when I compose phi of A with the identity in G prime, I will just get phi of A back again. Okay, so the answer here is phi of A.
So that now proves that all the elements in this same coset of the kernel of the homomorphism as this element little a uh, have to be mapped onto the same element as it. So all the elements within one coset are mapped onto the same thing by the homomorphism. So that gives us a lot of insight into the nature of homomorphisms. Okay, um, Basically, what we now know is that if you look at the kernel of the homomorphism and use that to partition up your domain group, then the cosets of the kernel of the homomorphism are all mapped onto the same element in the codomain group, and that's very, very nice. Okay, that gives us a good deal of insight into the nature of homomorphisms. Okay, it tells us that, in effect, the same number of elements in the domain group are being mapped onto every element in the codomain group. So if our homomorphism is not injective, not one-to-one, -one, i.e. you've got multiple elements in the domain being mapped onto one element in the codomain, then it's not the case that you can have, for instance, one element in the codomain having two elements in the domain group being mapped onto it, and another element in the codomain group having three elements being mapped onto it. Okay, they have to have the exact same number of elements being mapped onto them, basically. Of course, that sort of logic applies for finite groups here, okay, or fi at least finite kernels of homomorphisms. Okay, if the kernel of the homomorphism was infinite, then it would be uh, a little bit more uh, difficult to apply that sort of logic, but the same sort of idea holds true. Okay, right. So basically, uh, the amount by which injectivity fails for all of the elements in the codomain has to be the same in the case of a uh, homomorphism, which is quite nice. Okay, right. So now what I've shown you then is that all the elements in the same coset of the kernel of the homomorphism are mapped onto the same element in the codomain group then. Okay, what I now want to show you is that if we have elements in two different cosets of the kernel of the homomorphism, that they have to be mapped onto different elements in the codomain group. Okay, and we are heading towards this. We're just investigating at the moment, gaining a bit more understanding. Okay, so what I now want to show you is if I have some other coset, so let's take this one here. Let's say we have a representative of this coset, which we'll call little b, okay, and therefore we'll call this coset b bar here, okay, and I will colour in um, b bar in purple here, or outline it at least in purple. Okay, right. Uh, so I've now got this other coset, B bar, and I want to prove that the elements in these two cosets uh, have to be mapped onto different elements in the codomain group. Okay, so we know that in both of these cases, in both the case of A bar and B bar, all the elements of what each of those cosets have to be mapped onto the same element in the codomain group. What I now want to prove is that little a and little b cannot be mapped onto the same thing, so phi of a cannot be equal to phi of b, okay, if they are in different cosets. Okay, so how am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to quite simply do it by a proof by contradiction. Okay, so let's assume the exact opposite then. Okay, let's assume that phi of a is equal to phi of b, where a and b are not in the same coset of the kernel of the homomorphism. Okay, so I'm now assuming that phi of a is equal to phi of b, and I now need to find a contradiction, basically. Okay, so, um, how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to apply a very useful trick, okay? And it is a trick, you might not instantly think of doing this, but hopefully you will agree that I can do this, you can't stop me from doing this, and hopefully after you see how the trick works out, you'll see the motivation for doing it. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to compose both sides, on both sides, um, with, uh, sorry, I'm going to compose both sides of the equation on the right by phi of b inverse. Okay, so let me write this out. So what I'm now going to do is I'm going to compose phi of a with phi of b inverse. Okay, and I'm going to then have to do that on the other side of the equation. Okay, and composition here is currently in the uh, codomain group. Okay, so once again I'll colour code it in. So these compositions, these are in the codomain group. So all of these objects here are objects in the codomain group. Okay, so it might not be instantly obvious why you would want to do that, but hopefully you'll agree that if this is true, this is also true. Okay, so if this is true, it implies this is true. If this is true, it implies this is true. Okay, so I'm perfectly allowed to do that. 
okay? Now, what I can do then is apply the law of homomorphisms backwards to combine these things together. Okay, so I'm gonna... I'm starting on this side now, and I'm gonna go backwards onto that side. So I'm gonna turn this into phi of A composed with B inverse is equal to phi of B composed with B inverse, like so, where now these compositions that I've got here are compositions in the uh, domain group, capital G here, okay? Now, of course, the B and B inverse here will cancel with one another. They will give the identity in G, so this side will become phi of the identity of the domain group this time, and of course we know that the identity in the domain group is always a member of the kernel of the homomorphism, it's always sent onto the identity in G prime. Okay, so now what we get is that phi of A composed with B inverse is equal to uh, the identity in G prime. Now what does that tell us about this element, A composed with B inverse, this element here? Okay, it tells us that that is an element of the kernel of the homomorphism, okay, because it satisfies the definition. Any element that is mapped onto the identity in the codomain group is in the kernel of the homomorphism. So this now tells us that A composed with B inverse is equal to some little n, where little n is an element of the kernel of the homomorphism, okay? Right, so now what I can do is quite simply rearrange this new equation that I've got. Okay, I can compose on the uh, right-hand side, on both sides of the equation, by the element b, and what I'll get is that a is equal to n composed with b. Okay, now why is that um, helpful? Okay, well, this now means that a is an element of the... Um, right coset of the kernel of the homomorphism by B. Okay, look what I've got here. I've got A is equal to um, some element of the kernel of the homomorphism right multiplied by this element little b. Now, what does that instantly imply? That means that A must be in the coset of B, basically. So I'm now, I've now proven that A must be an element of B bar, basically, okay, because quite explicitly here I've got that A is equal to uh, some member of the kernel of the homomorphism uh, right multiplied by B, okay, and we know that the right and left cosets are going to be the same if we're working with a normal subgroup, so this means that A is an element of this coset B bar, okay, so by assuming this, I have now proven that A and B could not be in separate cosets, basically. So, if this is true, A and B must be in the same coset. Okay, so if A and B are not in the same coset, this cannot be true, basically. Phi of A cannot be equal to phi of B. Okay, so what we now know, then, is that homomorphisms map elements that are in different cosets of the kernel of the homomorphism onto different elements in the codomain group. Okay, so that also now gives us an improved understanding of uh, homomorphisms. Okay, right. Uh, in the next video, what we will now do is try and prove this. Okay, and the way that we'll try and do it is by establishing an isomorphism. Okay, and we'll use the insight that we now have concerning uh, group homomorphisms. Okay, and the way that really they carry all elements that are in the uh, coset of the kernel of the homomorphism, in the same coset of the, uh, the kernel of the homomorphism, onto the same element in the codomain group. And we'll use that insight to prove the first isomorphism theorem.